Lord, praise the Lord, and Christ in you. Yes, Spencer Spain, we really thank God for what he's doing in your midst. We are grateful to God that finally the time has come for Spencer to be inaugurated uh, in Spain. And we really thank God. We want to thank God for the life of our national head, our dear Apostle Bonsu, and then for our youth leader, Pastor Pache, and all of you out there for the great work you are doing. We are going to share with you on the effective Pensa leader, the effective Pensa leader. Leadership is such an important, very, very important uh, part of God's work. And I believe that as we share these principles with you, uh, they are going to, I mean, go a long way to help you in who you become as a leader that God has called. And then also about how you go about your work and about how you'll be able to produce the kind of results that God wants you to have. Let's begin with the word of God. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 45, verse 9. Genesis 45, verse 9. And I'll read from the New King James uh, Version of the Bible. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thou says this, uh, your son Joseph, God has made me a leader in Egypt. God has made me a leader in Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. The New King James actually says that, that says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. Do not tarry. Do not tarry. And the amplifier says that, hurry and go up to my father and tell him, your son Joseph says this to you. God has put me in charge of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. This is about a young person, Joseph, very young and about God fulfilling his own plans in his life. God, through very excruciating circumstances, had brought this young guy to a land, I mean, called Egypt, the superpower of the world by then, and he had become a prisoner, going through the struggles of life, and now time had come uh, where God himself was bringing him out as a young leader, and you know the story already about how through the interpretation of dreams, he became, I mean, he came up to recognition and he became a leader in Egypt. The man that was of very high prominence in Egypt, leadership by God's grace had found him. And when his brothers came to him looking for food and finally, as he revealed himself to his brothers, he came up with this statement that go, I want you to go and tell my father, tell him that your son Joseph says that, God has put me in charge of Egypt. God has made me a leader. And so come to me, I will help you. What are the things we learn from this text? First of all, Joseph, a young leader like you, makes us know that it is God who makes us leaders. We are made leaders because people chose us. We are not made leaders because even the church leaders chose us. Yes, God was doing something in our lives and he made the church leaders see and he chose us. And so our leadership call comes from God and our leadership responsibility is first of all to God. And that is why this understanding, I mean, this understanding is very key. Know that it's God who is calling you. And I don't know the kind of life you have gone through. Joseph went through a lot in the land of Egypt, many struggles here and there. And God himself called him. God is calling you today to be a pencil leader. Be proud and be happy. Don't be thinking that you have to wait, you have to grow, you have to be an old man before God calls you. He needs you now. Look around in our world. It's a world of young people. Young people doing great things. And so if we will not serve now, then when are we going to serve? There are many, many benefits with God using young people because we are able to reach our friends, we are able to reach our peers, and we are able to do something great for God. And I'm very happy that God has called you into leadership uh, in a time like this. He said, go! And tell my father that God, the Almighty One, has made me a leader and he has put me in charge of all of Egypt. God has put you in charge of Pensa, Spain, and we are grateful for that. Let's move on from this piece of scripture and talk about leadership. What does it mean? What is leadership? I want you to know that the greatest need in our world today is the need of leadership. We need leaders and we are just not finding them. We are just not finding them. So what is leadership? What is leadership? Many people have done well to define leadership. Somebody has said that leadership is moving people into God's agenda. What God wants done 
uh, when he gets one person who will move the people into that, that is leadership. Yes, that is true. And then uh, also Chambers, also Sanders, uh, and John Maxwell have also said that leadership is influence. And so that is one man's impact on another. That is leadership. Your ability to influence your friends to behave in a certain way or not becomes your leadership by what this definition is saying. And then we also have leadership being an act of releasing potentials in others. Leadership is not only about having an influence on other people or impacting them or letting them behave in some ways because of you, but rather, but also, sorry, releasing their potential, their God-given abilities that are silent and that are not known, that is not prominent. You seeing it ahead of others and then helping them to now grow it and operationalize it and making it work. So leadership is the art of releasing the potentials of other people. Leadership has also been defined as doing the right things. I love this definition of leadership because when we know the right thing to do, we have to do it. And in many cases, it takes leaders to ensure that the right thing is done. For instance, you come to a construction site uh, and I remember uh, when I was doing my national service after doing civil engineering and tech in our national service days and, when, and I began to work and so the construction is going on, everybody knows, every one of us knows that they have to put on their helmet. Yet many people would not want to put it on. It takes a leader to ensure that the right things are done in the people putting on, I mean, their, uh, their headgear. And so that is the leaders ensure that the right things are done. Because sometimes followers may know that this is the right thing to do and they may not want to do it. But so all these persons uh, help us to understand leadership. Another thing I have come across if I want somebody to say about leadership is that leadership is when people, when persons with certain motives and purposes mobilize in competition or in conflict with others, institutional, when those people, leadership is one person with certain motives and purposes, mobilize institutional, political, psychological, and other resources so as arouse, engage, and satisfy the motives of followers. So here, leaders, uh, what they do is that they have motives and purposes that push them to mobilize institutions, mobilize pol uh, I mean, political groups, and, and, and all that, and so many other people. They mobilize them and arouse them and let them have an interest uh, that will satisfy motives or other aspirations of other people. That's the leadership. And then maybe I will, the last one I will give about leadership is what Vance uh, Packard said. He said that leadership is getting at this to want to do something that you are convinced about that it should be done. Leadership is about getting people motivated, getting them set to want to do something that you are convinced about that is good and that it must be done. Leadership is also mobilizing others to us a common goal or a shared goal uh, by the leaders, the leader and the follower. This one is by Gary Wells and what it means is that the leader must get the followers to now come to share what he sees as good so that as he is doing it, they will also want to do it. It's about mobilizing others toward a goal that is shared between the leader and then the follower. But all together, what I love about leadership is that leadership is the essence uh, of influence. So we say that the essence of leadership is influence, which is the impact of one man on another. When all these definitions are put together, you will see what is clearly called influence. What is called influence? The leader's impact on another man. That is to say that leaders are able to get people to do some things. Uh, they are able to impact them to do some things. God's leaders influence people to do some things. And those things that they influence them to do is God's agenda. What God wants them. And so that's why I love this very definition that leadership is about moving people into God's agenda. For us in Christian leadership, our greater success is that we're able to influence people into God's agenda. God's agenda is about who he wants those people to be. God's agenda is what he wants them to become. And God's agenda is what he wants those people to do. God has what he wants to do at every point in time. And when I am able to move the people to do what God wants them to do, that's leadership. When I'm able to influence them to do or to become 
what God wants them to become, that is leadership. So as you are going to be a pencil leader, the thing about leadership altogether that I would not want you to forget is that leadership is your influence on other people. And that influence must be to make them what God wants them to, to, to be. And then to let them become what God wants them to become. And to let them do what God wants them to do. Is it by evangelism? That is what God wants his people to do. When you influence people into evangelism, you are a leader indeed in the house of God. Because you are moved them to do what God wants done. Yes, leaders influence people into God's agenda. Let's look at, quickly, let's look at some qualities of uh, leadership or some qualities of leaders. Uh, and it is very important for me to come to this point because I think that it's critical uh, that we know the qualities of leaders. First of all, leaders mobilize people into action. Leaders mobilize people into action. They get them to do something. And then they also focus on influencing others. Leaders focus on influencing others. And leaders are driven by clear goals. Leaders have goals ahead of them. And it drives them. They have common direction uh, with the people that they are leading. They communicate. And because of that, they have a common direction. They know that we are all going this way. Let's go. And then... One other thing is that leaders have people willing to follow them. Be able to influence people to be willing to follow them. So leadership is influence people for action. If I put all those qualities together, I can say that leadership is about influencing people for action. It is about moving people into in a certain direction, in the definite journey to a destination that people should know about and which uh, be which the knowledge of which would have been given them by the leader. It means that, yes, leadership is about influence. It is about moving people into action. So influence is involved. Action or the doing something is involved. Moving together in one direction is involved. Getting them to know where we are going is also involved. And having a picture about where we are going, at least the leader himself, knowing where we are going, at least in their mind, is very, very uh, important. This is very, very important, as I said. And the goal of leadership is not to become the people's most popular leader, but rather to become God's trustworthy agent who is able to influence people and make them do what God wants them, make them become who God wants them to become. That is very, very important. Leaders identify potential in people and they help them bring it to come to pass. Let's look at what leaders do. What leaders do. I made you know who leaders are. Let's look at some of the things leaders do. One of them is that they communicate. Oh, sorry. They identify, articulate, and then uh, share. What I mean is that what I mean is that leaders are able to identify. They're able to identify people. They're able to identify things to do. They're able to identify potential. And, and all those ones, and they are able to articulate it. So it's about the first one is about identifying identification. The second thing leaders do is that they communicate effectively. Leaders communicate their vision, and a leader must be known for a vision. Every good leader is known about something, and that is why one of the things I will ask you to do as you step into office is to put your vision together, drum it so hard, and let everybody know that this is what you stand for, and this is what God has given you uh, to do. Leaders, number three, leaders motivate people for action. They inspire them and they persuade them into action. They make them do something. That is who leaders are or what leaders do, sorry. The fourth thing leaders do is that they coach and develop people. They show people, do it this way, don't do it that way, this is better. And, and that is that they develop people, they give them the opportunity to grow, they encourage them and they make them grow. Whenever you meet a leader, your life doesn't remain at the same level because he motivates you, challenges you, gives you opportunity, and helps you to develop and to grow. Leaders also engage in strategic thinking. They sit down and think, and they plan ahead. When others are asleep, leaders are thinking, what are we going to do? We have to do this. We have to do this. They think about the group that God has made them a leader, look at their weaknesses, and see how they can help so that the group becomes better. Leaders develop strategy because they think critically. 
That is the next thing. They develop strategy. This is how we are going to do it and we'll do it this way. That is the developing strategy. And leaders are also comfortable around other leaders. That is very, very important. They take strategic action and then they resolve conflict. Leaders resolve conflict. They, leaders know that among all the other things, the most important of all the things leaders do is that they are able to hold people. And because of that, they help to resolve conflict so that people are together. There are many other things that leaders do and I wouldn't want to bore you with all that. For instance, they build teams, uh, they uphold accountability, they develop resources and all those ones. Time will not allow us to look at that. But let's look at this maybe uh, later when you have the PowerPoint or uh, when the opportunity comes, you know. But let's look at this. Let's look at things that I say they are top essentials for leaders, essential qualities for leaders. I've made you know who leaders are, I've made you know what leaders do, and I'm looking at essential qualities for leaders. And this one, you cannot say you don't have them and still be a leader. No. The first one is that every leader has a vision. Every leader has a vision. A vision, what is a vision? It is a clear mental picture of a preferred future. A future that is preferred, a future that is better than now, a future that is better than what we have now. I know that many young people say that things can be better, the church can be better, this can do, this can do this. When God gives you a, 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 I mean, the opportunity to be a leader, you must have a vision that is bringing a better future than what we have now. So a vision is a clear mental picture of a preferred future. And the leader knows clearly where he's going because he has a vision. Vision is the end product of whatever you are doing and whatever you want it to come to pass. We get vision from God as Christian leaders. When God calls us, we pray and God lays something on your heart and then you think about it with your leaders. They also contribute what they have received from God. We build it together. It becomes a corporate vision that we work with. And also in getting a vision, we get a vision also by creating something new. Look at what is there already, the things that are existing. What can we, how can we turn some of them around? So you can create something new as part of the vision and you can also build upon the foundations of the past and the present. The vision doesn't require that you bring new things all the time. But you look at how do I turn this into a better uh, tool? How do I do this so that I can, uh, some better thing can come out of it? So just yes, about receiving new ideas, it's also about building upon the foundation of the past and the present and then also about imagine with a reality that is better than what is currently available. That one was given by George Banner. Banner is a group that is doing a lot of uh, research into leadership. But essentially, I made you know the importance or the essentiality of leadership, of vision to leadership. Now, if you don't have a vision, you are not a leader. And then I say that for us as Christian leaders, we receive vision from God. It begins as a burden. But as you pray on it, God begins to direct you and you gather all the information God is giving you about the situation. Engage your other leaders, they bring more and then you concretize it into a vision. A vision must be in a document which is shared for everybody to see. The Bible says that make it plain and so that uh, the hero will see with it and run with it. So that they need to communicate your vision. Don't make it something in your head alone. Write it out and then let other people uh, know exactly where we are going. Where we are going. If you read scriptures like Acts chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, and Acts chapter 10, you see visions from God. I mean, you see that visions from God. What vision is not is, uh, I mean, uh, what leadership is not is giftedness. Uh, it's not giftedness that, like, you are gifted, that's why a leader, or oh, because they know how to do this, let's make them leaders. That's wrong. The next one is that it's not about qualification. That is the most qualified, so it should be the leader. No, it's not, it's, not, it's not also by experience. That this guy is the most experienced. He's been here for 15 years. Let's make him the leader. No, it's not also about the enjoyment of power that they are putting you there. You are coming to enjoy. And now you are the organ. That's not leadership. Leadership is not so. It's also uh, not even having been groomed for a position like. Uh, as for me, I'm groomed, they, they give birth to me. Like sometimes you have the sons of kings and other leaders like that, sons of pastors, and they think that because they, they, I mean, they are born into the, the, the family, 
uh, they will rise up to be leaders. No, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it at all. This in themselves can give us an edge in leadership. But you see, uh, they are not leadership per se. Leadership is, as I said, a burden from God. By how far I brought you, you should know that leadership is a burden from God uh, on some work that you must do, which you continue to rely on Him to understand and to hold together. And then you mobilize people into that agenda of God. That agenda of God has to do with what God wants them to become. Or it will have to do with what God wants them to do. What God know that the most important of all the things is not administrative systems. It's not anything. But it's about people. People is the number one. And leaders spend their time with people. They understand people. They seek the good of people. They encourage and energize people. They enhance the self-worth of people. They love people. They cherish people. And they are always helping people. The, the, the leaders are able to attract people and they're able to use the abilities of those people to achieve what God wants them uh, to achieve. They're able to bring the experiences of people, the education of people, the training, the spiritual gift of people all together to achieve an aim. And leaders also develop and raise other leaders. If you are going to be a pencil leader for one year, by the time you are leaving, there should be other young people you are prepared who can take over from you. That is leadership. And I love John Maxwell, John C. Maxwell, who spoke about this, what he calls the developmental model for leaders. If you are a leader and you want to develop other leaders, what you do is John Maxwell gives us a five-point model. The first one is called I model. I model means I do it. Everybody looks at how I do it. Then the second level is I mentor. It means that I do it and I, I do it all right, but I get you to watch me. I get you to follow me. I go with you. And as I do, you see it. Then the next one is I monitor. In I monitor, you do it or the leader does it. Sorry, the, the follower will do it and the leader will watch. So I make you do it and I see how you do it. Then you come to I motivate. I motivate means I let you do it. I am not monitoring. I'm not coming any strongly, but I let you do it. And then the last one is that we multiply. We multiply means as I do it, and I'm giving the space to do it. So you also are giving birth to other people, and then I'm also giving birth, then we multiply. This thing is very, very important. This thing is very, very important. Essential qualities about leadership is that they must have been called by God because they have a burden, they have a vision or an assignment from God, something that they want to achieve for the group that they sense God is giving them. And I spoke about vision, the essential quality, remember? First one is vision, and I've taken time to under, to let you understand everything about vision, and I've made you know how people are also important in vision. The next essential quality about leadership is that leaders have Christ-like character. We are talking about Christian leaders. This is so essential, Christ-like character. Their character is informed by the Bible, and they are self-controlled. They are doing all things. They are not people who are taking advantage of our ladies, or ladies who are taking advantage of, the, of our guys. Or stealing money or doing any of those things or talking anyhow or are rude or are not respecting church leaders they behave themselves they, they are people of character this is an essential quality the second essential quality apart from having a vision having a Christ-like character is the third one and maybe there's a second one sorry and the third one is that leaders possess what is called functional qualities I spoke to you that being gifted, having talent, having abilities, having education, having the know-how and the skills in themselves is not leadership. But leaders have this. Leaders, every leader has some, some area God has given him. And they have, they call them functional, uh, what we functional qualities. Other things that they use. Some are able to convince people, talk well, some have training in this, some do this, some do this. And it enables them to be able to accomplish uh, the things God wants them to do. So I'll move on to the second side, the pencil leader. But you may take note, you may want to go and read more about Moses' example of leadership in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9 to 14, or, or even to 18. He chose wise, understanding, and respected people to serve as leaders. That's what Moses did. He chose wise, understanding, and respected people to serve as leaders. 
We have Paul's example too in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. The qualification of leaders, please make time and read. We have another example that Paul gives us in Titus chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. Qualities of leadership. Mm. And then some of those ones. So you may look at those scriptures whenever you are free. But for now, let me come to the pencil leader. If you're a pencil leader, all the things I've spoken about leadership concerns you. It concerns you. And you must grow in them. At this point, let me go to, let's all of us go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. 2 Timothy is written by Apostle Paul to a very, very young person like you and I, a very young leader. And in chapter 1, verse 40, he said, Guard and keep the precious and excellently adapted uh, uh, to you. Uh, I think that I will want to move away from the amplifier. Let me see. Verse 14. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. That good thing which was committed to you, do well to keep it by the help of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. The Holy Ghost who lives inside of you. The NIV says that guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Every pencil leader has been given some good deposit by God, which I've spoken about, and then also by our common tradition, how pencil started. What has been bequeathed to us is what is called the mandate of pencil. Why does pencil exist? That is very, very important. And why do we exist? We exist to bring together all students on campus who are members of the Church of Pentecost and our friends from other churches and, and, and who are also not Christians. We bring them together. It is mobilizing. If you are called a pencil leader, you have to continue and guard this tradition that pencil is about gathering people going to preach about Jesus, bringing people, visiting people, and all that, but gathering people. It's a pencil tradition. We gather people. We gather people. And then number two is to deepen and strengthen personal faith in Jesus Christ and to deepen the spiritual lives of members through the study of the Bible, prayer, and fellowship. Pencil is about Bible study. It's about prayer. It's about fellowship. And when we do this and we continue to do it, we are deepening and we are strengthening the personal faith of people in the Lord Jesus. We are deepening their spiritual lives. We make them concrete Christians, grounded people. So don't change your personal group into any other thing. Let it be about the word, about prayer, about fellowship. Yes. And whatever we learn, let's do it. The third thing is that pencil exists to inculcate into members a lifestyle of modesty and decency. Pencil is not a place where we raise any batch of people. Young people who don't respect, young people who are dressing anyhow, young people who are following philosophies that are not of the world. I mean, and all that. We check each other. We, we are modest people. We are members of the Church of Pentecost. We live by the doctrines of the church. And we live in decency. We, we, we are on top of our world. We are modern people in a modern world. Contemporary people who know what's up. But we are modest because we have principles of the word of God that help us. And we all cherish those ones. And then also... We exist to carry out evangelism on and off campus. The pencil that you are leading must be a pencil that is into evangelism. Don't let people just come to church and sit and go. Mobilize all of them into evangelism because evangelism, evangelism is pencil. And evangelism is pencil. And ensure, as I said, that the pencil you are leading is a pencil that's a mighty force for evangelism. Let them go everywhere, both physically and online and everywhere. Let them tell people about Jesus. So release them all the time for this things. And then, dear friends, PENSA also exists to encourage and prepare members of the church for responsible church membership. You are ensuring that when these people are leaving your fold, they are coming back into the church to become the members who will be in the church and the leaders who will take over. Let them love the church. Uh, find a very mature way to always link the church. Don't operate the campus ministry going off, 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 learning after some other church and becoming what is that. But keep it modern and relevant in your world. That's what we are talking about. We also exist to provide a free flow of information between the church and the, the, the students. So whenever announcement, campaigns, international announcement, other things like that, you the pencil leader, you help them. 
uh, to also get. We also exist to help members to identify and develop their ministries and leadership potentials. This is very important. Help them to identify and then release them to be doing something. Uh, we don't want to turn them into people who are just listening and waiting, but releasing them, uh, making them know their potentials and helping them to grow it and releasing them to be in ministry for God, to be working for God. And then we also exist to coordinate the activities of PENSA in other institutions and designated zones. That means that as you are going to be the national coordinating team, your responsibility will be to check other new, open new branches and check their activities and help them. Help them. That is very important. Uh, I would want to say that the PENSA leader must understand this mandate, these essentials of PENSA. They must remain the same, they cannot change, but we'll use different ways to do it. So they must understand this mandate and by effective leadership, which I've already spoken about, make this mandate happen in the group that God has made them leaders. You are fortunate that the Lord has called you brother. Never think that anybody called you. It's God himself who has called you like Joseph. God has made you a leader in Spain. Maybe that's not where you, uh, you come from, but God has made you a leader in a strange land. Rise to leadership. And do your best. In Joseph's time, God wanted him to feed the whole world. In your time, God wants you to provide leadership for Pencil Spain. Do it and never look back. Never let anybody look back on you. Never let anybody discourage you. Don't even let the system discourage you. For if God himself made you a leader, then none of these things is reason enough for you to back out or for you not to achieve the reason why God called you. We are grateful to God for choosing you and there is no other person God could have chosen than you. And please don't disappoint him and lead excellently. Mobilize people and lead you and do something great for our God. I believe that you have been blessed and I believe that your life will never be the same. Let's continue to lead and let's see what God will do to us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Thank you very much and the Lord bless you. Amen.